Going back to our subject at hand, which is diet, I think uh, diet is one of the places you can make one of the biggest, easiest changes. I don't want to say it's easy. Changing one's diet is not easy, but it's not expensive and it is doable. Um, and like you said, there's no absolutes. There are a couple of absolutes as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let me, let's dive into those. I would say the first absolute, and I've been on TikTok and Twitter and, and I'm getting more of a <laughs> reputation as a no sugar guy uh, than I want because I don't want to be the guy who's, who's just, that's the only thing I'm speaking about, but sugar is a poison. Let's talk about, about sugar one second, Helen. Yeah. So sugar is a poison. Now we need sugar. Let's put that first and foremost. If we don't have sugar, our cell, we can't stay alive, stay alive. If our sugar drops to zero in our bloodstream, we will die. So we need sugar. And this is, again, it's about balance, but too much sugar becomes very problematic. And when we have sugar floating around in our bloodstream, so that happens when we eat things that get absorbed very quickly. So simple carbohydrates, Hydrates, What's that sweets, mean? Rice, desserts. bread? Yeah. So, so anything like basic sugar um, and then things like rice and white bread, things that don't have fiber in them. When we eat those, those get absorbed very quickly by our body and it goes directly into sugar in our bloodstream. Now, when that happens, that's really dangerous because when we have sugar, it starts to bind to all the different proteins. Now, some of you may understand one of the proteins it binds to is hemoglobin. That's why we can kind of get a measurement of how much sugar, the average sugar in your bloodstream by measuring your hemoglobin A1C. That's just a measurement of how much sugar has attached to your hemoglobin molecules or your red blood cells. But sugar also attaches to a lot of other proteins. Now, when that happens, and that's what we call a glycation reaction. So when sugar binds to proteins, it's a glycation. It happens without enzymes. It's just, it's called, again, an amidori reaction. And it, it will happen on its own when sugar is in contact with the proteins. And then what happens is our immune system goes, ooh, Ooh, that looks foreign, right? Our immune system's used to seeing our own proteins, but it's not used to seeing the proteins with sugar molecules attached to it. And so it will actually mount an immune response to it. So we call these, you know, proteins that have all the sugars attached to them, we call those ages. And I think that's a really appropriate name, advanced glycation end products, right? And it does, it ages us. And that those ages attach, we actually have receptors for them specifically to get rid of them in our body because they're so dangerous. And those are called receptors of advanced glycation end products or rages. <laughs> and rages <laughs> are, you know, uh, I think they're really well named. Um, and, and it does, it causes a full body wide uh, inflammatory reaction. And we can get into what inflammation is as well. But inflammation, that's the the pain in your joints, the redness in your skin. And over, we do know that inflammation that doesn't shut off um, can cause a lot of damage. It's one of the underlying factors of a lot of chronic diseases. Let's take this a step further because, um, I, again, you need glucose in your bloodstream. Your brain works on glucose and, mm -hmm. and, and ketones. and But it's when the levels get too high and uh, you can wear a, a uh, simple, uh, you know, glucose monitor, which I, which I do, a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor to look at the glucose levels in your bloodstream. And if you have pure sugar or white bread, you'll see this spike and then insulin gets pumped into your body and it, it drops down. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, what's interesting is that the impact of this glyco glycosylation, this, this, uh, this attachment of the glucose it, when I think about this, and if you can expand on this, is it's a cardiovascular inflammatory, a neuroinflammatory, um, it feeds cancers. I mean, there's like nothing good about it. Yeah, the, the rages was just one thing. It causes inflammation in your blood vessels, absolutely, in your brain. Uh, you know, there is nothing good about it. And uh, one of the hallmarks of cancer, to your point, Peter, is the fact that the cells, the cancer cells now, uh, all the cells in our body other than our brain cells, typically they, they burn fat. So at rest and when our mitochondria, the little power plants of our cell that take the food that we eat and turn it into energy to fuel our muscles, to fuel you know our brain, everything that we need to do, all the, the reactions in our body, they, they love to 
to take fat and make energy from it. Now, cancer cells can only, one of the hallmarks of cancer is that they burn sugar. They can't burn fat. So the mitochondria are so damaged in cancer cells that they cannot burn fat and they only burn sugar. So the the whole idea that sugar feeds cancer is absolutely true. And, you know, anyone dealing with cancer, the first thing you do is want to limit the sugar. I mean, we know this because PET scans uh, are basically labeled sugar, right? And that's how so we PET search scan for- is a- is a positron emission tomography. It's tomography. a way of, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a kind of yeah. scan. Yeah. That, yeah. To look for cancer in the body and, and it's radio labeled sugar molecules because that sugar will go directly to where the cancer is. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just want to make our first point here, which is uh, the body was never designed to, to consume this much sugar, right? Uh, this use of sugar cane and sugar in our diet is something recent over the last few hundred years. It didn't evolve with us over hundreds of thousands of years. And it's not easy. In fact, sugar is addicting. Um, You know, I have two 12 year olds and I look at the cereals they're eating and it's like all sugar. I mean, I I taste it and I go like, this is disgusting. It's so sweet. It brings back memories. Uh, (laughs) But, uh, you know, it's not easy to break a sugar uh, addiction. Yeah, it, it's difficult. I think, Peter, to your point with evolution, we've actually evolved to have a sweet tooth. So if we think of human evolution, you know, we would have periods of feast kind of in the fall during harvest when we had an abundance of food. And then we would have kind of periods of famine, especially over the winter. Now, during that fall is when things, sweet things were available. You know, ripened fruit is sweet right? Honey that's available from that we would go and get. So we have this innate need and, and uh, I'd say um, we search out sweet things and sugar. I think that's in all humans. Uh, and at the time, it was very beneficial. So what would happen when we ate that sugar, it would induce some insulin resistance. Okay, so remember, when we eat sugar, it comes into our bloodstream, and we then, our our body senses it, it says sugar's too high, and it will produce insulin. Our pancreas, the beta cells in our pancreas make the insulin, and the insulin is like the little door knocker on the cell, and it says, binds to this, the receptor on the cell basically knocks on the door and it says, open up, let the sugar inside. And so the sugar can now go from the bloodstream inside the cell where it's safe. Okay, so so that's a good thing. Now, over time, when we have a lot of sugar around, and also, you know, fat in there as well, but think of a lot of sugar, what happens is the cell kind of gets tired of opening up that door. And the, the little door knocker, our body has to actually produce more and more insulin for the sugar to get inside, for the cell to open up the door, almost like the little boy who cried wolf too many times. And so, and so that's what we call insulin resistance, where our cells become, start becoming resistant to the action of insulin. And it, therefore, the sugar ends up staying around in our bloodstream much longer. And that's the first sign of, of course, diabetes when it gets to a certain point. But if we think back to the evolution, we, during the fall, we would induce by eating a lot of sweets, this, this sort of state of insulin resistance, which what did that do? That allowed us to store fat, right? When we're insulin resistant, we store a lot of fat, that sugar gets converted very quickly to fat. And those fat stores would then allow us to survive through the winter when there wasn't a lot of food there. So, you know, the people genetically that can do this, the people that are much more prone to insulin resistance, those are the people that survived, right? And we're all usually descendants of that. So they're really, if you think about the fit genes, certain certain traits, depending on your environment, are very beneficial. You take those and you put those in a different environment and they become very detrimental. So humans were never meant to be exposed to vast amounts of calories and food and sugar at all times. We're meant to go through those periods of feasting and famine. Yeah. So again, bottom line is uh, uh, high glycemic index foods, uh, sugar, candy, all of these things, not healthy for you. You know, my dad used to say in ancient Greek, pan metron ariston, which means everything in moderation. Um, and that's and that's fine, but we are addicted to it. Uh, one thing that I do every year uh, with uh, dear friend, Guillermo uh, Navarrete, is 
as part of Abundance 360 and Abundance Platinum, we do a 22-day no sugar fast. And everybody together in a WhatsApp group, so it's much easier to do this as a group than on your own, is you give up sugar. Um, and we go to really a ketogenic diet uh, for 22 days. And at the end of that, you feel like you have control back, right? You have control back over that sweet tooth and, and you can say no a lot easier. And so I did that, you know, two and a half years ago and I've had uh, really, um, I'm very, very careful about when I eat any sugar. If I'm going to eat something, it's going to be very mindful and it's going to be a very limited amount. Um, so and you'll I, notice when you actually get rid of that sweet tooth, Peter, that things just taste ultra sweet. You yes. know, when I first yeah. cut out sugar in my diet, it takes about three months to completely overcome that craving and that addiction to sugar. And just so you know, sugar is as addictive as cocaine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I, haven't, we, I haven't tried cocaine, so I wouldn't actually yeah. know, but I have tried sugar. 